Whatever the British had done in order to capture Lagos and to sign the hundreds of treaties to hold some of the towns and settlements in the southern territories under the tight command of the Royal Niger Company rule, nothing could prepare the African continent and the Nigeria to be for the sometimes bloody race between the British Empire and other European powers for their part of Africa. Making Nigeria was being shaped by the meetings in Europe to divide up the continent, and Britain was in the lead. British justification for creating empire was Christianity, commerce, and civilization. But in actual fact, it was trade and the extraction of wealth. And that's why the method of possessing the colonies was always from the coast to the inland. That's why the taking of the West African territory in the Niger area started with Lagos. I'm an urban historian and a speculative cartographer. What this means is that in thinking about the history of cities, I really think about the role that maps and spatial history, so specifically maps and map making, the role that they play in understanding the history of a place and the people who live there. One of the things I do in this kind of map making is that with ArcGIS, you can actually take historical maps and contemporary maps of cities and do what we call georeferencing, which is basically just, you know, assigning spatial data to old maps. So for instance, you know, if something has always been there, that can be one reference point that through time. And what we can do is we can layer these maps and we can actually compare and contrast, look through them, and with the spyglass application, we can actually pair through the present into the past to really think about the old parts of the city. This spatial history technique was essential to understand the truth about the Lagos attack and the beginning of empire in the Nigeria to be. In the official report of the events that led to the reduction of Lagos in 1851, Captain Jones's letter to Commodore Bruce of the Royal Navy reporting what had happened on December the 29th, 1851, read as follows. Sir, the island of Lagos and its dependencies are prostrate before us, ours by the right of conquest, to deal with as might be most expedient. Everyone had fled. It was more a destruction, not a reduction. Do such reports seek to sanitize our 1851 history? The reduction of Lagos is actually a really interesting case because it's actually been quite controversial in the ways that people have seen it. Earlier historians have talked about how, from the British side, how it was really an, a benevolent act to sort of rescue us and liberate us from, you know, slavery, enslavement, things like that. But then later, um, Nigerian historians, when we began to write sort of academic histories, really pushed back on this narrative that actually England had a lot to gain from actually taking over Lagos, because they know that whoever controls Lagos controls not only the lagoon routes, but also the sea routes. And so, which is why you see after the British come in and they reinstall Akitoi, you then see that people come flooding from all over, not just that part of the Bight of Benin, but all over West Africa, from Freetown, from Abelkata, from Madagri. Everyone wants to be in Lagos because this is not only a commercial hub, but also geographically the center of so much that is possible in West Africa. So really, there's really a lot at stake in who controlled the city and the island. Taking the kingdom of Lagos for the British crown was by no means straightforward. At the failed attack of the 25th of November, 1851, 
The Africans had inflicted injury and loss of pride on their invaders. The British Navy, long known as the world's naval superpower, deemed their attack a failure and retreated to return only one month later with increased firepower. And so the two African kings were at war, uh, nephew and uncle, King Kosoko and King Akito. The war set the context for the British invasion that was soon to come. Akito was desperate to regain power after 10 years of being forced out of power by his nephew, King Kosoko. Akito teamed up with the British and assisted the invasion of his own kingdom. Kosoko obviously was up to the task of the defense. And as part of the defense that Kosoko put up for defending the kingdom, there were 60 cannons very similar to the one I'm standing in front of here now. And these 60 cannons lined up the shoreline to protect the kingdom from what was clearly going to be the Royal Navy attack. There were a hundred dugout canoes with well-armed men and 5,000 musketeers placed in strategic places in the bush. You can imagine the awesome sight of the 20 ship armada of the British Royal Navy approaching the Lagos shore. And so on the 24th of December, 1851, the first attack came. The majority of the people, of the people had followed so-called to exile, leaving the place almost a desolate and deserted place. After clearing the ground for uh, Akitoe, the guy itself was almost in very late status at the time. Yeah, because it was bombed, wasn't it? Yes, because the place was subjected to attack. That's the king's house, the king's yes. palace. But actually it was quite tragic for the city and the human toll and the physical toll and the infrastructure and the population was really dramatic and intense. So we know that there are estimates of about 22,000 people. We've heard that nearly 90% of them were gone. In actual fact, the invasion must have caused huge loss on both sides, even if the records don't show it because the British government literally apologized. I have to acquaint you that Her Majesty's government is of the opinion that you were not born out of either by the circumstances of the case or by your instructions from Her Majesty's government in directing that Her Majesty's naval forces should land and attack Lagos. And Her Majesty's government greatly regrets the loss of life, which has been the consequence of that attack. December 27th, 1851. It was late in the afternoon when the final cannon shots were fired on this very location. And the palace of the king was finally destroyed. With the king absent, the British invaders were able to take his throne. And by taking his throne, the first possession in this part of the country then became the Lagos colony. And that event led to the creation of the colony of Nigeria. The act of taking the king's throne is a pattern that they would perfect in other parts of the country to create the Nigerian colony. So after 10 years of virtual rule through a series of consuls, ostensibly here for trade, the decision was taken to formally take possession of Lagos and there create the Crown Colony of Lagos in 1861. From late July of 1861, the British Consul and the Royal Navy encouraged, warned, threatened, and finally forced King Dusmu to sign a treaty that would formally cede possession of the entire territory of Lagos 
the kingdom was to become part of the British Empire. On the 6th of August, 1861, Josmu reluctantly got on board HMS Prometheus, moored along the shores here, and signed the treaty that would start a series of events that would lead to the creation of Nigeria. And so many of the great explorers of the 1800s were essentially said to be after geographic expeditions, looking for the sources of many of the great rivers in Africa, Congo, the Nile, the Niger, the Limpopo. But in actual fact, they were looking for navigable ways into the interior of Africa. One of them that's well known is Dr. Livingston. He died in Congo without finding the source of the Great Congo River. His work was probably finished by Henry Stanley, a flamboyant man who said he'd met him several times. And the important phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume. The importance of this to our journey is that Congo was then seized by King Leopold in 1876. That act of seizure by a small country who wasn't even a, a great power of the time led the great powers to think, hang on, this guy could go for more African territory. And that gave birth to the conference that is now known as the Berlin Conference. But at that time, it was called the African Conference, except there were no Africans at the conference. The great powers met and they divided up the territory into parcels of land that they then presumed to own. The only thing was that they said each power must be able to exercise effective control. And where one power had effective control, the other power would have to yield possession to that country. And that's what was called the scramble, the scramble to establish effective occupation. It was so bad that Lord Salisbury said, we have been engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no white man's foot has ever trod. We have been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediment that we never knew where the mountains, rivers or lakes were. After the Berlin Conference in 1898, the British government established the Niger Committee also known as the Selborne Committee, led by the Under Secretary of State, Lord Selborne. The committee's mission was to determine the future of the territory. Ultimately, they resolved to merge the occupied territories into one country, to keep the French out and to keep any other great powers out of the territory. So let's quickly shatter a myth right here and now. The idea that Nigeria was somehow made by Lord Frederick Lugard as a father of amalgamation and, and that he is the person who set the course of this country is not correct. The members of this committee were the thinkers who brought about the territory that is now known as Nigeria. The members were Sir Walter Egerton, governor of Lagos at the time, Sir Ralph Moore, the high commissioner of the newly proclaimed Southern Protectorate, Reginald Antrobos, the undersecretary in the colonial office and probably the real thinker behind the idea of One Nigeria, and Sir George Goldie, the maverick creator of the Royal Niger Company, whose administration of parts of the territory on behalf of the British government created the Southern Protectorate. So just how were this possessed effective occupation established? They couldn't be in all over Africa at the right time at the same time. So a system of companies was developed. A lot of the Liverpool trading companies had been competing in Africa anyway, and they'd been competing in Nigeria already. One person's idea to amalgamate a lot of these companies, idea floated by George Tobman Gordy, was to create what was called the Central Africa Trading Company. 
to reduce the competition. But in order to exploit the opportunity properly, he needed to have some sort of monopoly. He approached the British government, who was aware of the need for effective occupation, and gave a charter over much of what was to become Nigeria. That charter company grew to become the Royal Niger Company. Tubman's company administration was effectively an agent to British colonialism. The company administered the land and extracted profit for itself and paid for the charter. And this system continued well into the end of the century. So as the debate and the scramble were going on, Britain was able to establish effective occupation through the company. The Lagos colony and its growing protectorate was effective in bringing the kingdoms of what was described as Yoruba land under British trade influence and therefore control. A succession of Lagos governors increased British territory. Governor Alfred Maloney, followed by Governor Denton, established a military garrison at Ibadu beyond the colony. But it was Governor Sir Gilbert Carter who defined the protectorate of the colony into a large expanse covering the Yoruba-speaking country. In May 1892, a punitive force fought the formidable Ijebu from the ports of Ekpe to Ijebode. From 1893 then on, Carter's colony was unstoppable. He marched to Abelkuta, obtained a treaty with his leadership, and then went on to the north, Oyo, where he hurriedly arranged a treaty and executed one with the still respected and powerful Alafi. Carter went on to Ogbomosho and then to Ilori, effectively breaking up internal hostility by establishing British control. The entire West was under the control of the Lagos colony and its protectorate. The consolidation of British interests had been going on in the east of the Niger since at least 1879. The main traders holding dubious treaties were Alexander Miller Brothers and Co. of Glasgow, James Pinnock and Co. of Liverpool, West Africa Company in Manchester, and the Central Trading Company of London. These all came together to form Goldie's Royal Niger Company. Up until 1891, when Sir Major Claude MacDonald was appointed governor of the protectorate, separate from the Royal Niger Company, the British consular system still did not have an effective government in the oil rivers of the Nigeria to be. The authority and transformation of the oil rivers protectorate into the Niger Coast protectorate was a perfect springboard to capture the eastern area of the Nigeria to be. Borny Island, located at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, facing the Bight of Guinea, near the area that would later be named Port Harcourt, had already become a successful trading post for the British. The role of Consul John Beecroft in changing the trajectory of Borny Island and in the making of Nigeria must not be forgotten. He had been involved in the British bombardment of Lagos in 1851 and was a signatory to the treaty between Great Britain and Lagos in 1852. From the time of his appointment as consul of the Bites of Benin and Biafra, he quickly became both notorious and infamous. Internal squabbles within Bonny Island made it easy for him to engineer the takeover of the island and make it the first of the Delta communities to become a British asset. It was on this island of Boni that Mbanaso, later to be known as Jobu Juboha, or 
Jaja, a former slave working for the Anna people traders with other British companies, would finally gain prominence. The nickname Jaja was given to him by the British traders who would come to know him very well. During the power struggle in Boni in 1870, this Kenu boy Jaja bought the Okujombo trading house and broke away to make a new settlement that was named Okobo. Okobo was closer to the commercial markets and Jaja exercised control with the interior country, making the Europeans more and more dependent on his territory. Jaja broke the Boni trade dominance with British help. Jaja's migration from Boni to the new Okobo made him the self-proclaimed king of the island. His treaty with the company was to place his territory under the protection of the British. Jaja was quite cooperative with the British, even against his own fellow natives, at one time sending troops to assist the British in subduing the Ashanti in the War of 1875. Control of the trade meant he shrewdly controlled the prices. To the European companies, this was the perfect excuse to get rid of them. They wanted control back. But for the British, the Berlin Conference had given them the right, they thought, the perceived right, to take direct control of the territory, regardless of what their old ally, King Jaja, wanted. Consul H. H. Johnson got what he thought was the British home government's permission to deport and depose the king. Johnson invited Jaja for a meeting on board the HMS Gosho. Uh, naturally suspicious, Jaja asked for guarantees of his safety and his liberty. Johnson said, you'll be free to go once you've heard the message from the British government. Johnson lied. Johnson wrote to Jaja, if you attend tomorrow, I pledge you my word, you will be free to come and go. But if you do not attend, I should conclude that you be guilty of the charges brought against you and shall immediately proceed to carry out your punishment. Jaja was arrested as soon as he arrived and taken to Accra, where at a sham, he was found guilty of breaking the treaty. From there, he was deported to the West Indies. He died attempting to return to his homeland. Freedom fighter, a shrewd man of commerce, you decide. He protected his interest and his people to the very last. What's not often mentioned is that um, as early as 1892, Obao Obawen had signed a treaty with the British consuls. Uh, the British consul Galloway had um, entered a treaty of protection. To the British, it meant that the Benin kingdom was already a client. Um, the understanding may not have been clear to everybody, but obviously that could have been what motivated consul John Phillips when he decided in 1897 to embark on what is now called the Benin Expedition that led into two massacres. The Oba of Arwen had signed a treaty in 1892 which largely placed his sovereignty under British protectorate, meaning protected by the British against other European powers and not, as was thought, protecting the Oba's kingdom. The Oba was essentially a client. He was a dependent of the Queen of England. The order to the Consul General of the Niger Protectorate, John Phillips, to delay the expedition and the visit to the Benin Kingdom was not taken. On their way, the Phillips contingent was ambushed and shot at before they could reach for their weapons. Some were beheaded, several were just killed. Some British historians have described the attack of the 4th of January, a Benin massacre. 
only Captain Alan Boisragon and District Commissioner Lilk escaped. But the revenge attack itself was the real massacre. A month later, 1,500 men were raised to deal a fatal blow on the Dominion Kingdom. The city and the empire fell. On the 17th of February 1897, outright British rule was imposed. The Oba of Arawen was deposed and later sent to die in exile. And so this second bloody expedition was the the massacre, but in an act of double jeopardy. Over 4,000 artifacts of culture, adornment, worship, paraphernalia of, of office of the Benin were carted away, forcefully seized. These valuable artifacts are now to be found in museums in Britain, France, Germany, and the United States of America. A double jeopardy of not only the loss of lives, for the loss of culture. You wonder what moral authority these museums have when they hunt down rope climbing art thieves after a well planned heist that ends in a speedy getaway with missing classics of Rembrandt, Picasso, or Da Vinci. This was olden day identity theft. It still appears disproportionate and unjustifiable till this day. The only other authority that uh, existed in the East was the Arachuku of Oracle and what the British called the uh, Long Juju. The situation where two authorities were competing the British authority couldn't settle. They had to take the Arachuku. The area had been settled by the Ibibios in about 380. The Igbo migrants arrived subsequently, and both were subdued at the Ibibio War that established the Aro State, covering Arujuku, Eza, Bende, Ohapia, Idem, and Arunzog, well into the present day Anambra State. This was the Aro State that the British met. In 1902, the decision was taken to attack Aro, a strong contingent of both Lagos and Northern forces under the direction of Sir Ralph Moore, contributed to the so-called expedition. They marched in columns to Arochukwu and overcame the resistance with brute force. And so the 1902 attack on the Aro was finally concluded. The counter-influence to the British in the entire area was complete. In 1905, Onitja itself faced a strong expedition in revenge for the loss of the British medical officer, Dr. Stewart. The occupation was completed in 1906, along with what was left of the East, Pale. The East was taken. Next, we see the bloody campaign across the north of the colony. We see the events that led to the joining up of the colony and protectorates by the British, amalgamation into one country. 